so yes, this is the full stack node, not to be confused with sub-stack. Uh, it's a different stack, but node is multi-stacked. Uh, my name is Max Ogden. I'm really excited to be here in Dublin. My mom is a redhead named Patty, and her maiden name is Porter. So I feel like in my entire life, and my high school mascot was the Fighting Irish. Uh, so I've just like waited my whole life to come here, and it's great to be amongst uh, the Irish. Um, so my talk is called Handcrafted Artisanal, Artisanal JavaScript. Uh, I have 107 slides, so let's get into it. Um, so uh, this was a cool thing that happened to me. Uh, to get to know me a little bit, I take photos of cats around the world a lot. Somebody actually made an app um, that you can go see all the photos that are tagged Cat Mapper online, um, including many of my photos, such as from my hometown of Portland. If you've ever seen the TV show Portlandia, it's a reality TV show, pretty much. Um, and I lived that reality. Portland's an amazing place. Um, also, Real Time Cats is now online. You should go there in your browser and uh, blow your mind. Um, thank you, Dominic. I actually really needed that domain, oddly enough, for a project that I open sourced last week, which is all the cat photos I've ever taken. Um, and similarly, I also do a thing called JS for Cats, which is an introduction to the JavaScript programming language designed for cats to lower the barrier of entry because too many programmers use JavaScripts and those people are kind of nerdy and describe things in a complex way, but uh, I made it accessible to cats. So you could go there, send your cats there, send me photos of your cats looking at it. Um, and I work on a company called Gather uh, with Michael. Michael spoke earlier. Um, and Gather is at Gather on Twitter. It's a thing that runs on your phone and gets you to go outside and hang out with people face to face because I think that talking to people is really important. The original social network. And so um, me and Michael are just two people at our company. This is us hacking yesterday um, and a lot of coffee. And uh, it's just the two of us, um, kind of like that Will Smith song. You guys have ever heard Just the Two of Us? Except uh, I'm not Michael's dad or vice versa. Um, and we also have a designer that does contract work for us. He also has a sweet beard. His name is Michael also. Um, and he's OBJCTS on the tweeters. Um, and he is our interaction designer, graphic designer. But we just um, get work from him every once in a while. Most of the time, it's just me and Michael working on the implementation because the design is the easy part. Um, and between the two of us, Michael uh, and I, cumulatively, we have 168 GitHub repos and 131 additional forks. Um, so something like 400 repos or what, I can't do math, 320 repos or something. Um, and one high school diploma. Um, and I'm really, I'm proud of that because uh, Michael and I have really proven that GitHub repos are totally free and it's uh, a supplement for a computer science education, arguably, maybe. Uh, but go and make more GitHub repos, damn it. Uh, if you're not actively publishing GitHub repos, they don't have to be high quality. I have one that's just cat photos. Um, but they somehow make you seem really reputable. Um, and about 10% of them are from the last year that we've spent on Gather. So Michael wrote a blog post called Open Source on his blog that details some of the stuff that we've open sourced from working on our company. But the reason I bring this up is that we've really integrated open source into our workflow. Um, and we've been working on our product for about a year. It's about, uh, this is highly scientific, 94% JavaScript. I think it's actually pretty accurate. 3% Java and 3% Objective-C. Um, and okay, so 94% JavaScript for an entire company. This is like everything. So how are we using JavaScript? Um, so number one, HTTP. Um, we have to do a lot of HTTP. Most of our apps, since it runs on phones, it talks to the cloud from your phone. So we have a JSON API. Node's actually really awesome for building APIs. Um, and JSON, the JS, Node has a JS. They can do things together. Um, we also uh, use HTTP to talk to Couch, because Couch has HTTP built in. So all you need to talk to Couch, you don't need like a database driver. You need an HTTP request mechanism, which Michael wrote. Um, we use it to send Android push notifications. Google runs a thing called the GCM. Uh, for sending pushes to Android devices, and you send them HTTP JSON objects, and they send messages down to Androids that make little things pop up on people's Android, phone, Android phones. We use it for OAuth um, to redirect and do the OAuth flow and signing keys and sending them in headers. Uh, we make HTTP requests outbound to APIs. So HTTP is super important to our products. Um, we use it to talk to Twitter, to Facebook. We use it. Uh, we use HTTP for our maps. So this is a map. Screenshot from our app, 
like running on a desktop browser. The maps are from another company that's node powered. Really beautiful, OpenStreetMap powered data called Mapbox. And Mapbox is a node company that does streaming tiles for maps. So um, you can custom style your maps the way you want them to look. You're not stuck with, uh, like, say you go with Google Maps. You're going to get the yellow and uh, tan Google tiles all the time. And they let you tweak that stuff a little bit. But you also have to use Google everything if you use Google Maps. You're stuck. It's toxic data. With Mapbox, um, you pay them and you get OpenStreetMap data. You can do whatever you want with it. It's amazing. And it's node powered. So even our tiles and our maps are served from Node on a different system from our production system. Um, the other thing we use is Socket.io. Um, it's a pretty big deal in Node. It's why most people are using Node. I think they see Socket.io and they're like, wow, that's awesome. I want that. That's like Rails but faster. Cool. That's the conception. I'll get into that later. But um, we use Socket.io in our app. Uh, it's one of the features that we're working on. It's not done. So if you install the app, you don't get it yet but it'll be coming soon. Basically, um, since we're running on all these phones, we wanted a way for people to have chat with each other in real time. So Socket.io made sense because it works uh, with a bunch of different protocols. And I was going to use these numbers as uh, the protocols that we're using, but Socket.io isn't really a protocol, but it's like, it has like five different transports, but it is kind of its own protocol. So um, I'll talk about the specifics, but mostly we use the WebSocket part of Socket.io and the HTTP polling transport for Socket.io. But Socket.io implements something on top of both of these, which is nice. Um, and we also use JavaScript for MapReduce. Uh, because we're using Couch, um, Couch has SpiderMonkey, another JavaScript engine built into it that uh, actually iterates over the data on disk. Uh, Erlang processes the JavaScript VM, and like they talk between JavaScript and Erlang back and forth and get data from disk and send it back over the wire. So you could write JavaScript functions that run inside your database and give you data. I'm just going to, we're an exhaustive list of that 94% right now. The other thing we use is TCP. Um, Apple, to send push notifications, they don't give you an HTTP and JSON API. They give you a TCP, SSL TLS API that you have to do streaming and TCP to send push notifications. So we do that from Node. I'll also say that everything that's done in Node is done uh, in one process. Um, and we use this thing called a service registry that uh, is a term I learned from Substack. And we use a Substack module called Cport to actually scale out our processes horizontally. Um, I don't really know what scaling out horizontally means. I just use that term. But I think it means like it's like web scale. Um, so like Node, we use Node. The fifth thing, the way we use JavaScript in Node is as a switchboard in a phone system. You know, you have all the input and output coming in to one place, and you need something that can plug them all into each other um, and make sure they can all talk to each other. Um, an example of this is PhoneGap. PhoneGap and Node are actually kind of the same thing. It's just one's for phones and one's for servers. Um, PhoneGap is JavaScript talking to native code. Node is JavaScript talking to native code. Uh, so PhoneGap, our app is all JavaScript. Uh, it's HTML, CSS, JavaScript running in a web view, an embedded web, web browser on Android. You get the Android web kit. Uh, container on iOS, you get the iOS WebKit container. Um, so how are we not using JavaScript? Um, so we don't have a web framework, per se. Um, instead of a web framework, um, we kind of use small pieces, a modular approach. Um, I actually like to summarize it this way, and this is not a troll at all. I used to be a Rails developer. If we wanted a web framework, we would be using something like Rails, or Django, or any of the ones in other languages, but because those have solved a lot of awesome problems, they're good at their job. Uh, but you don't always want a web framework. Node is not a web framework. This is actually, I like that this has been on the screen a couple times today, but if you look at Node and how it's described, it's described as a thing for building network applications. So what does that mean? Uh, network applications are wider than just web frameworks. So kind of like if your perception of Node is that it's a web framework, it allows you to maybe build web frameworks. Um, it does HTTP. It has modules. People write web frameworks with it. Those things aren't always like Node, though. And this is a distinction that uh, it takes a seasoned Node programmer to, to make. If you show me a repo that's a web framework, I can tell you if it's like Node-ish or if it's some person's DSL, basically. And this is what we've been hearing with the streams discussions lately is uh, people are starting to figure out how to use these powerful core parts of Node. By the way, Node is a pretty small core. Um, but some of the things that are built on top of Node 
didn't implement those things. So it sucks when you learn something that's in Node Core and you go to try to use it in a popular project, but that popular project hasn't caught up with Node Core yet, which hopefully Node Core is small enough that everybody can keep up with it because it won't be adding that much new stuff in the future. But I'll pick on Socket.io for a minute. Um, and we were just discussing on Twitter, they're working towards this, but you can't do this. Like say I'm running in a web browser and I have a file that I drop on a web browser and I want it to go into Node, into the server, over XHR, um, or whatever Socket.io uses or transport data. I can't take a file upload stream and pipe it to Socket.io yet. Um, but that's because Socket.io was written before streams were popular and Socket.io is a sufficiently large project, so it moves sufficiently slow, but hopefully they'll add this kind of stuff. So uh, when you're uh, thinking about using things, see if they're like Node-ish or not. Um, but, uh, you know, when things are like Node, they're awesome. So uh, we also don't use that many things on the server for our app. It's mostly a mobile phone app. We have two server-side templates. Um, if we were a business logic CRM thingy-mabobber, uh, we would, and we're, you know, a more traditional kind of Rails app or something, we would probably want to have a better web, web framework. We don't need a web framework for our app. We need mobile phones to talk to each other. So um, we only have two server-side templates, so we don't really need a web framework. We have hundreds of server-side APIs, and that's where Node really shines. So. Here is a highly technical diagram. Um, let me make sure it doesn't repeat there. So what happens, I'll just go over this really quickly. Um, what happens is we have this thing called stud, which is a TLS terminator written in C++, I think. And Michael wrote a library for Node to use stud. And all it does is it's like a load balancer. It takes connections and points them somewhere. The way it knows to point them somewhere is there's this thing in Node, the purple is nodes talking to each other. And if you think about it, Node.js is singular, but it implies that you're gonna have multiple of them, nodes.js. So here's our nodes.js, and all the servers are node processes running on potentially different boxes. So Cport is another node process that uh, everybody who's running registers with Cport all the time, real-time connection. So the minute they go down, Cport knows they're down. And the proxy talks to Cport and says, hey, who do I got? So the proxy knows who's up and who to send processes to. This is the service registry. And we're just using the Cport module by Substack to actually accomplish this. Um, and then all of our servers do stuff, and then they talk to things like databases. So let's look at an actual server and how we're uh, doing stuff. So um, Node, here is why you should use Node. Um, it takes input and output from the top, uh, think of those as like the request and response that you get in HTTP server. And it does all this awesome stuff from one process. Um, so in one node process, and again, we're running a bunch of node processes load balance, but this is just what one of them can be doing. It can talk to Google and Apple over TCP and HTTPS. It can talk to Facebook and Twitter over HTTPS. It can talk to CouchDB over HTTP. It can talk to Redis over the Redis protocol. It can serve HTTP and JSON responses to our mobile phone clients. And it can talk WebSockets over Socket.io. It's awesome. It allows us to be the switchboard that everything talks to. Um, and it's all written in JavaScript. So that brings us to code reuse. Um, so like, I, I get this a lot from people that get into Node and they say, yeah, we want this dream of like getting rid of all of our insert language here engineers and making everybody do JavaScript. Um, and it turns out that we don't really share code. Michael and I have different styles. And a lot of JavaScript developers have different styles. We share pretty much nothing. So here's Michael, some of Michael's code. Um, and it's repeating vertically, so just look at the first couple functions. But just like kind of blur your eyes and look at it and kind of or like look at the style. Like I actually was talking with Michael last night and he was like, oh yeah, me and Max, we don't use semicolons. And I'm like, you use semicolons. And he was like, oh yeah, the little tail. That's just a style thing because nobody else does it. Yeah, it, this tail serves no purpose. Michael just does it for stylistic reasons. Because that's, you know, JavaScript, you can, there's a million and a half ways to skin a cat. So this is some of Michael's code. You'll notice that he has an object that he is calling a method chain using a return indent style. And, you know, you look at this, he uses a E for errors somewhere in here, like uh, for his error callback. He just uses E instead of ER or ERR. There's, these, there's like a 
100 little things that define any JavaScript programmer style that is unique. Here's some of my code. Um, I like functions. I don't like var x equals function. I like function var. And I use ERR sometimes, and I use ERR the other time, like in this same code. Oh, wait, this isn't an error. Anyway, different styles. So Michael's code, my code. Michael's code, my code. Michael's code, my code. So, you know, they are different. So we, I don't want to share code. I want to have my code, and he can have his code, but they talk over the same protocol to each other. Um, but, you know, actually, that was a generalization. We share a little. This is client side code. Um, Browserify is a thing. So it lets me use the same kind of require keyword that you get in client side applications. And what I've kind of realized is Node has some beautifully elegant, simple patterns that you've heard about in the previous talks that are just as useful on the client as they are on the server. And I did a talk about this at NodeConf in the United States, so I won't go into detail, but um, it makes sense to copy some of the things Node does on the client. Um, and Browserify lets you package a lot of the 15,000, 16,000 modules in NPM and get them to run in a browser. So play around with it. Um, write your own Browserify competitor. Like, it's a cool, we want to merge these ecosystems with client side and server side, I think, so we can share modules. And as long as you use this, you can um, use the node module pattern, which basically lets you, instead of when you load JavaScript into your environment, it polluting your global namespace, you get to define whatever the hell you want the module to get loaded in as. So you could require jQuery as the variable pizza. This is a really powerful construct, too, that I wish client-side developers had easy, simple access to that wasn't a complicated spec. Um, and this is like what I dream of is like, hey, man, you got your node in my browser. Not we're like making sacrifices on both sides, but we're just, if the browser has cool, simple patterns and the server has cool, simple patterns, let's share them both in both places in a way that makes sense. Oh, yeah. And here's an example of uh, some node stuff running in the client. Um, I'm tethered right now over my phone connection because I wasn't sure how good the Wi-Fi was going to be. And also on purpose because this, what this demo does is it's a few lines of code that uh, streams a JSON API from its couch TV. But basically it's like a million, 1.2 million rows of JSON. Uh, it's every property in the city of Oakland, all the houses. And it's the, there's going to be little dots that appear. And the dots are the uh, value of the houses. <laughs> So as it streams data down over this super slow connection, dots appear. And this is one XHR request. Every time it parses, it's using a streaming JSON parser. Every time it parses a new row in the JSON in a single XHR request, it parses out the value of the house, makes the dot bigger if it's a more expensive house. Um, on a fast connection, this kills the browser in like three seconds because I'm using SVG and I'm creating a new SVG element for every row. As soon as you get like a thousand SVG elements on the page, it kills everything. But it's actually really awesome. It's an awesome demo on a slow, there's like a mansion that just came in over here. And um, so this is like, this is cool because I got to use streams to do something on the client. Imagine if I had to wait a minute for a million rows of JSON to parse in the client and then the Chrome tab crashes because I tried to parse a million rows at once and I couldn't show them the visualization. This is using streams to do real-time visualization with no wait time in the browser using SVG, um, using Browserify. So streams are not just useful for Node programs, they're useful for JavaScript programs. Um, so, but, so there's, there's a little bit of reuse with Browserify, but most of the time, totally different styles. So uh, I also, though, this is a cool part, I can fix bugs without waiting. So this is me changing our query, JavaScript query uh, syntax, whatever it's called. Um, the, the thing that lives on the server that goes into Couch and queries our spatial database, I found a bug. And because I know JavaScript, I can go and fix the query. I don't have to wait for the backend team, aka Michael, to go and fix it. So it's nice that you're empowered as a JavaScript developer to go in and work in other projects. And you know, when you're in another project, use the style of the other project. Um, and here's another thing we don't use. We don't care about JavaScript syntax. I think it's a bike shed. Michael agrees. We're kind of trying to be post-syntactically oriented or something. Um, we don't try to use things that fix syntax. Who cares? Um, flow control, use callbacks. I wrote a thing called callbackhell.com. You should go read it and rant with me about it. But basically, it's like name your functions, and you don't have to use flow control libraries, except for a certain 10% like, case. And then you should use them, but people will try to use them prematurely. Um, keep it simple, right? Here is a pro tip for Node. Uh, if you want to learn like all of Node, learn how these three words uh, are used inside of Node, and you'll be able to go into anything in Node and know how it works. 
If you know how callbacks work, the error response thing, you understand how code isn't going to be linear. It's going to maybe like jump around to different lines based on when events happen. Um, and you know how the event emitter works, and you know how streams work. That's like most of Node. So learn those things. Um, this is uh, Michael's a Node core contributor, and uh, I'm also a Node core contributor. This is a patch I landed a few days ago. Uh, it's a one-line CSS patch to Node. <laughs> Which, uh, because now I have a fork and a pull request in Node, I'm going to get like $50,000 more of my salary at my next startup job. Um, <laughs> so I'm totally just uh, trolling right now. But Michael actually writes stuff in Node Core, but I don't. I have written like very little C in my life. That Objective-C in Java, those 3% earlier, that was me learning them this year so that I could write mobile phone apps and make them better. Um, so. What I'm trying to get at is that Node shouldn't be hard. You shouldn't have to be a low-level hacker to do it. You should just know JavaScript and be able to play with these things. Um, and because uh, I finished with a few minutes to spare, I just decided to put a bunch of cats in here. Um, I said I had 107 slides, like the last 30 are cats. So this is a cat in Portland. Um, here's another cat in Portland. This cat was, had two different colored eyes, which are awesome. Um, I actually, this guy's, let me fix the aspect ratio of this browser so the cats show up correctly. Um, here we go. So I like this guy a lot. That's Isaac's cat, Aristotle, my favorite cat ever. Um, the Node.js cat, uh, one of the two. Uh, this was one in Argentina, actually, uh, that was, um, I'm pretty sure, looking for food. This cat had a beard, it's my roommate's cat. Um, I'm just gonna get through all these really quick. What I'm really leading up to here is that if you, oh, here's Aristotle again. Aristotle's uh, an incredible creature. Um, if you, here's Aristotle again. So if you go to real-time cats now, um, what I did was I put every cat photo I've ever taken, as well as a Maru gif in the background. If anybody knows Maru, raise their hands. Best cat on the internet. Um, and I put all the other cats I have online, so if you ever need some BSD licensed cats, you can go here. Um, most of these cat photos were taken in Oakland, California, the Node, Node Vanguard home base. Um, there are going to be people building robots in basements, uh, flying helicopters in warehouses, riding bicycles to coffee shops, drinking way too much espresso and hacking in alleyways, writing Node code, node code and Node modules. So if you're ever in the Bay Area, don't go to San Francisco. It's full of annoying people. Go to Oakland and write some note code. Um, and thank you very much.